our speaker. Our speaker is Joanna Kuaga Ximus from Nicolas Copernicus University, and she will talk about entropy rate or product of independent processes. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, thank you for introducing me. Thank you for the invitation. And I'm afraid I will forget at the end. So happy birthday, Felix. <laughs> okay, so what I want to speak about are two seemingly unrelated things. Uh, one of them is uh, Furstenberg's uh, filtering problem. And the other one are B3 systems. So I will give you some background on each of uh, these two topics. Uh, I will formulate some questions and at some point you, you will realize that in fact, there is a connection between, between these two things. So what about A? We have two stationary real valued processes. X is interpreted as a signal and Y is interpreted uh, as some noise. And now the noise is interfering with the signal and we want to know when we can recover the signal from the sum x plus y. What I forgot to add is that x and y are independent so that uh, the setting can uh, this interpretation uh, makes sense at all. And this was a question posed by Furstenberg. That was a paper from 19, I never remember, 67 or 76. And uh, uh, okay, so this is a question which is formulated in the language of uh, stationary processes. But in fact, this question is related to more to the world of dynamical systems. And it happens in the following way. So the central notion of that paper is uh, the notion of this jointness of dynamical systems. So if I have one system X, B, mu, T, so I have a standard probability borel space x d mu and i have a measure preserving uh, automorphism acting on it so that's one system then i have another one and i will say that these two systems are disjoint if the only measure okay so let's put it here if the only measure that lives on the product space which is invariant under the product action t times s and which has the correct marginals new and new is the product measure. Okay. <laughs> okay, so T and S are all disjoint if the product measure is the unique. It was supposed to be bigger, right? We can't see anything. Okay, so let's put it on the other blackboard. And 
and uh, okay, so this, this is this was a central notion on this uh, of this paper, and in fact, it was used to, to answer this very question. So the assumptions are the following: so we have our two stationary real value processes; they're independent. And we assume one more thing, namely that X and Y are integrable. And now, if the dynamical systems uh, uh, arising from these two processes are disjoint, then it is possible to recover X from the sum X plus Y. If I probably owe you some explanation here. So what are the dynamical systems uh, coming from these processes and what it means that you can actually recover one thing from another. So let me start with the second of these two things because it's quicker to explain. So being able to recover X from X plus Y, this means just that this process is measurable with respect to the sigma algebra generated by this process. So we want one thing to be measurable with respect to, to the other. And as for the dynamical systems, well, uh, if you have a stationary process, then there is a standard way of creating a symbolic dynamical system corresponding to it. And you can also go the other way around. So X is my stationary real process, then I can look at the space of two-sided sequences with real entries. I can put the left shift on this space. And of course, each stationary process comes with its distribution. So let's call it So this gives me a symbolic dynamical system together with this measure coming from this process. And to go the other way around, I don't necessarily need to start with a symbolic dynamical system. I can take any measure of the red system. I take a measurable real valued function. And this gives me a process like this. And if this family of function, functions written here generates the whole sigma algebra B, then uh, by doing one and the other procedure, so by, so if I start with, okay, so let me start the sentence one again, once again. So I start with a measure theoretical dynamical system and I take a function F such that this family of functions generates this sigma algebra. So at this uh, stage uh, of what I'm doing, I have a stationary process. So I can do this first procedure. So I can associate to this stationary process a symbolic dynamical system. And this assumption that uh, this family of functions generate sigma algebra B results in that this symbolic dynamical system will be measured theoretically isomorphic to the original one. So now we have a dictionary from uh, stationary processes to dynamical systems and vice versa. And in fact, we have here this integrability assumption, which due to a much more recent result of Garbit, this can be dropped. So the same statement is true even without the assumption that X and Y are integrable. OK, 
Okay, so now instead of the sum x plus y, I want to consider the product the x times y. Why not? So of course, if my processes take only positive values, then I can use this result together with this addition by Garby to apply logarithms and I'm, I'm done. So if I want something interesting to happen, I need to be in the situation where logarithms don't work. And one very simple possibility of such a situation is when X takes two values, zero and one. This won't work by applying logarithms. Yes, when we admit zero as a value. So my y i is always either zero or one. And uh, I want to understand if it's possible to recover x from the product. So you can think of, you can still think of x as of your signal. And now what is this y doing? It's just breaking the signal. So every now and then we just miss our signal and we uh, don't, don't get, uh, I wanted to say we don't get full information, but this might be misleading. So we don't we don't uh, get uh, all the signal X because of these uh, interruptions. Okay, so classically, since X is the signal, and Y is the noise. So uh, we rather assume that X is uh, in some way deterministic and Y is in some way chaotic. So let's say the entropy rate, rate of X is zero and the entropy rate of Y, the entropy rate of the noise is positive. So for us, this won't be the case. We'll work under uh, the opposite assumptions, namely, X will be of positive entropy rate and Y, be, y will be of zero entropy. So, so somehow this interpretation of losing your signal doesn't make as much sense as I would like to. Uh, and that's why now I want to convince you why putting the opposite assumptions still makes sense. So there are at least two reasons for this. So one of them, is another filtering problem, namely one by Furstenberg, uh, Price, and Weiss. That was 1995 much more recent and now the situation is like this instead of having two processes i begin with a family of stationary processes indexed by some j it can be finite it can be infinite uh, doesn't really uh, matter and i have another process u which is And value. So well, this is x, j with index i, and j is telling us which uh, process we are looking at. And u is another process that is n value. And we assume that all these, these things are.
are jointly stationary. So now what we want to do is that we want to use process U to choose among these processes. So we create a new process that looks like this. And it is just X I with index UI. And now we want to know whether we can recover U from this new process. And again, recovering means that this process U uh, will be measurable with uh, respect to the sigma algebra generated by this one. So to answer this question, we need a notion that is stronger than the one of this jointness, namely double disjointness. So this is no longer a symmetric notion. So when we talk or is it about this jointness, I can switch the coordinates and uh, I get exactly the same thing. Here, it won't be the case. So we say that Y is, I will write DD, doubly disjoint from X. If every self-joining of Y remains disjoint from X. Maybe I'm mixing, mixing up a little bit uh, these two worlds of processes and dynamical systems, but what you should always think about is that if you have a process, you have a dynamical system and vice versa. So what I wrote uh, actually does make sense. And now, uh, a necessary condition for y to be doubly disjoint from x is so if y is doubly disjoint from x then necessarily the entropy rate of y is equal to zero so this is one explanation why it makes sense to assume that y is of zero entropy and then actually of positive entropy so, so that we can distinguish between uh, these two things. And uh, to obtain uh, a pair x, y, such that y is disjoint from x, it now suffices to take x with trivial tail sigma algebra. Okay, so what I forgot to tell you to tell you about was the result coming from that paper. And it is the following. This is Furstenberg, Torres, and right? And it says the following. So suppose that all these processes are jointly stationary. And that U is doubly disjoint from XI for every I. Then one can recover U uh, from XU. So you may wonder why am I telling you about this other more complicated filtering problem? So there is a good reason, namely 
uh, taking a product x times y is a very simple special case of this. So if we take just two processes in this family, so j is either zero or one, and they are defined like this, then it, and if we take y u equal to y, then it becomes clear that this mysterious x with upper index u is nothing but the product of two processes x and y. So this old result uh, tells us when we can recover u, and now it's reasonable to ask whether or when we can recover x. Okay, so let us look more closely at the situation which we are in. So I have a pair of my processes. And here downstairs, I have their product. So the reason why I drew this arrow is that uh, when we pass to the corresponding dynamical systems, then this will correspond exactly to some factor of uh, this process with two coordinates. So in particular, if I look at the entropy rate of this curve, it will be uh, greater or equal than the entropy of this product, x times y. And now my assumption is that y is of zero entropy. So this will be actually the same as the entropy of X. So if I go from here to here, to here, the entropy can only drop. And if I want to hope to be able to recover X from the product X times Y, I cannot have any drop. But if the entropy drops, I'm losing information and that's it. So, so this takes us to the following question so maybe okay so let me write that thing down if we want to recover x from x times y then we must have this. So the first question will be, maybe we can get something even better. Maybe we can get a formula for this uh, entropy rate of the product. So is there any or any reason, reasonable one? The second question would be whether going from here to here, you can kill all the entropy. So we speak about the drop or the absence of drop and one extreme situation would be that here the entropy is positive. And if you go downstairs, everything disappears. So oh, let me write it like this. And finally, can we have the equality? So is there any chance, so at least chance to be able to recover uh, X from the product? So yes, so this is 
it as far as the processes are concerned. And now I want to pass to the second uh, topic, which uh, is important for me, namely B for systems, and you will see how these two things are related. So what is a what is a B free system? So take and a subset to B of natural numbers and define the corresponding set of multiples. It will be denoted by MB. So these are just all integers divisible by some member of our set. And then we have its complement. This is called the B, B free set. So these are integers that have no divisors in set B. So for example, you can take as B the set of squares of all primes, of all primes, and then the set of B free integers will be the set of square free integers. So integer is not divisible by any uh, square of an integer. And this will be nothing else but the square of the Mebius function extended symmetrically uh, to the negative uh, part of uh, integer. So such sets of multiples and sets of B for integers were studied from number theoretical point of view in the 30s. And uh, together with Sarnak's conjecture in 2010, the dynamical approach came into play. And uh, pretty often we can see that these two things do intertwine. So, okay, so special case here, including the square free case is the world Erdős case. And it takes place if the elements of set B are pairwise co-prime and the sum of the reciprocals converges. Okay, so this is the number theoretic side, and now I need to start to introduce some dynamics. So I have this B3 set, and now I want to associate a dynamical system to it. So what I do is I take the characteristic function of my B3 set, and this is some point in the space of two-sided zero one sequences. So for simplicity, I will denote it by eta because this think is too long. And uh, now with each point in the space, I can naturally, uh, I can naturally associate a subsheet. So this will be not denoted by X eta, and this is nothing else but the closure of the orbit of eta under the left sheet. And I will call this topological dynamical system a B-free system. And in the Erdős case, it turns out that this uh, subshift X eta has a special property called heredity. What does it mean? It means that X eta is closed under a very nice natural operation. Namely, if I have a sequence in X eta, this is a zero one sequence, I can choose to replace some of the ones by zeros and I still stay in the same space. So if X is here, Y is some zero one sequence that is smaller or equal than X coordinate wise, then Y, 
space in X eta. So in general, if we don't have this assumption that we're in the R dash case, this might not be true, but then you just take the smallest hereditary subshift containing pure subshift and you study this. And then this is called the hereditary uh, closure of your subshift. it will be denoted by X eta tilde. So I said what it is. Now I will also write it down. So I take the product space of X eta and the full shift on zero and one, and I apply to it the map that uh, multiplies uh, sequences coordinate wise, so M. M of X. Okay, so let's put it like this. Okay, so we have all the most important objects in the theory of B persistence already defined. Defined, and now I want to talk about talk about invariant measures uh, of B-free systems. So one very important uh, uh, invariant measure is uh, so-called Mirsky measure. It is often denoted like this. And so roughly speaking, this measure is looking at frequencies of block zero one blocks uh, on our sequence eta. So why am I saying roughly? Well, this frequency might not exist, but there is a natural subsequence along it will exist. Uh, so I don't want to go into this. So you can just think of uh, the frequency uh, of blocks. Okay, and this is one measure. And now we can start to think whether having this special measure, we can produce more measures. And you, there is already a tool for this at the blackboard. So look, I have this simple map M that is multiplying my sequences uh, on each respective coordinate. So if, um, okay, so let me erase. This, so if I take the Mirsky measure here, and if I take any measure on the full ship here, and if I take any joining, then I will get something uh, in the image and it will be an S invariant measure. So we have a way of producing plenty of invariant measures for B3 system. And why am I saying that there will be plenty? Well, that's not clear uh, if you just start looking at it, but it turns out that all measures, that all invariant measures for B3 systems arise this way. So this is a theorem of me, Mario Flamanchek, Benji Weiss. That was 2015, it was the Erdes case. And then with Aurelia Dimek and Stanislav Kassian uh, and Marius, we extended it to the general case. So maybe I said the name, so I will not put them on the blackboard. And it says that all invariant measures uh, 
here arise this way. Okay, so another important thing to know about buffer system is that they are intrinsically ergodic. It means that if the topological entropy of this system is positive, and this is not a very strong condition because it is equivalent to the Mirsky measure being not trivial, so being not a delta Dirac measure at zeros, then there will be exactly one measure realizing uh, the topological entropy. And in fact, we can describe this measure. So a unique measure of maximal entropy is yes, the image via M of the product of the Mirsky measure and the Bernoulli measure one half, one half on this side. So we exactly know what we are dealing with. And since this came up, we started to wonder what happens if we replace this Bernoulli measure by other methods, whether we can say something about the entropy. So the entropy of this one is known. It is uh, the same as the density of ones on, uh, on eta. So this will be questions part B. So the first question would be whether we can have some formula for the entropy of this convolution type measure. I put in a star uh, to, to have some shorter notation uh, for this measure. The second question, which we had back then, was whether the positivity of the entropy of this measure on the second coordinate implies that also this is positive. And finally, can we have the equality? So can we have no entropy? Oh, yes, this is still on the blackboard. And now you can see where the connection between these two things. So here we want the formula for the entropy rate of the product of processes. Here we have formula for this convolution. And if you pass from these symbolic dynamical systems to stationary processes, you will get exactly this question. And the same happens at each level of uh, these questions. Okay, so I've stated all the questions I was interested in. So now let us go to some answers. Okay, so let me go back to the processes. I will say that this pair is good if the following conditions hold. So first of all, I want X to be finitely valued. Y is binary, so so far nothing changed. I want these two processes to be independent. This is also not new. And the third condition is that I want Y to visit uh, the state one infinitely often in the future and in the past.
So for example, if I assume that Y is ergodic, this is, uh, uh, will take place, but I don't need ergodicity for all the results. So that's why I'm putting it this way. And uh, this third condition means that uh, actually I can define something called uh, the return time process. So these are just the consecutive visits of Y to state one. So I want, I don't want to write this down because the idea is simple, the formula is long. So I will spare you the formula. And now I'm ready to finally give you something more concrete, something you didn't know already. So this is the main technical result of our paper with Michal. And I will put 2020 and 21 because in 20 we have a weaker version and recently we came up with something we're finally happy about and which looks more complete. So it goes like this. If this pair is good, then we have the following two formulas for the conditional entropy rate. So let me spare you the word conditional. Let us assume additionally that the entropy rate of Y is zero to make things simpler. So one formula is like this. So first you have a factor uh, depending on how often, so depending on the probability of y being equal to one, and then you have the following conditional expectation, which you won't like at first, but I will try to convince you that this is a nice object. So, We have two formulas. Let me write down both of them first, and then I will try to explain uh, what they are. So this is the first for formula. And then if additionally, Y is ergodic, then you get something like the, so this will tell us about the entropy drop or its absence. So here again, there is some conditional expectation. Okay, so what is happening here? So I guess this and this part looks most, most mysterious to you. So what you need to do is to choose first small r. So this is the sequence of return times of y to state one and compute a certain entropy rate. So here you look at the relative entropy rate of x0 given some instances of x in the past, depending on what your y or r is. So basically you get some function of little r. So we have some f of r. And then 
we compute this conditional expectation where little r is replaced by the capital R. And this, this is due to the fact that uh, this R depends on Y and uh, Y is a stationary process. So this is a thing that is uh, changing depending uh, where uh, we are. Okay. Uh, why? Uh, this I understand that if Y is almost always uh, zero, then uh, this says that uh, H of X times Y equals X of H. And I think it should okay, be that. Be that I, I think I forgot to say that you want this. Yes, but if it is very close to uh, zero, I would think that uh, if Y is very close to always being one, then X times Y should have the same entropy as X. And if white is very close to always being zero, then the entropy of X times Y should be smaller. And somehow this formula is in, in the other direction. We can uh, look at it later. Now I'm in the middle of talking. So let's check it afterwards. Maybe I made some type on the way. I'm not like 1,000% sure, but it looks correct to me. Yes, X of larger. So you need to subtract something, right? Yes, I just don't understand why this thing which is subtracted is uh, larger when uh, white is most often one than when white is most often zero. Okay, so maybe I make some type of uh, like one and zero, but I, I, I don't think Okay, so let's check afterwards and now let me try to explain what kind of consequences uh, these formulas have. Okay, so I asked uh, for formulas for the entropy rate of the product, so I already have it. So there are two more questions left. So, uh, so since those questions B are a special instance of these, let me begin with these first and then explain how and then explain how that uh, fits into the picture so how much time do i have do i have like five more minutes or three minutes okay so i'm not going to write anything i'm just going to tell you a story so or maybe i wrote the right down just time time is it Okay, so we have question two, and it turns out that if this pair is good, and if the entropy rate of Y is zero, then the I don't like this. <laughs> Okay, then uh, the answer to the second question uh, is positive. So the positivity of the entropy of X implies the positivity of the entropy of the product. So it means you cannot easily kill the whole entropy that you have. And as for question three, there is a certain notion related to entropy, which is however not uh, an isomorphism invariant, namely the notion of a stationary process being uh, bilaterally deterministic. And okay, let me skip the definition and let me just tell you that this notion uh, can make us divide the class of all processes into three subclasses. So we have zero entropy processes that are out automatic, like, automatically bilaterally deterministic. 
and we have positive entropy processes which can either be bilaterally deterministic or not. So this class is where is where my process Y is, and this class of uh, processes of positive entropy that are not bilaterally deterministic is where my process X will be. And the result is that uh, if I have a pair, good pair of processes and if the return times can be arbitrarily large with positive probability, and if my process X is not bilaterally deterministic, then I will always get some entropy drop. Okay, so I'm over time. So let me stop here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the good talk. And any questions? These, these three questions B, they were officially stated in, in our paper, right? Yes, that's correct, but somehow this is much nicer as no, it turned out afterwards. But this is what we left open in 2015, right? Yes, yes, so it was in uh, that paper with Benji. Okay, and any other questions? Okay, then let us thank our speaker again. The next talk will resume at 5.10. Greg. All right, I think this is the time that we reserve for the picture online. So I think the ones, the ones that are attending online and want to appear in the picture, please open your web camera. We, we may repeat this process tomorrow again, but. Okay. I don't know if it will be a few of us, but. Okay, so let me wait a couple of seconds more. Okay. So thank you very much. We we may try again tomorrow see if if someone has missed it. Thank you. Thank you.